Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Lake Forest Church of Christ Wednesday night uh, class. Uh, we have a guest speaker this evening who's been gracious enough to join us, uh, Matt Wallen, a good friend of mine uh, from Faulkner uh, back in the early 2000s, who works at the uh, House to House uh, program uh, overseen by the Jacksonville, Alabama Church of Christ, has been gracious enough to speak to us this evening. Uh, and he will be giving us a class on the slowness of God. And so thank you, Matt, for being with us this evening. Good evening, Lake Forest. It's good to be with you under these unusual circumstances. Yesterday was actually our first time to ever be here. Uh, I was here along with my family, family of six, and you guys were so kind to us, even from a distance. And, and I hope that we'll be able to be back with you at some point when we won't have to be so distanced. Uh, in addition to yesterday, everything that we know about this congregation is, is good and encouraging. The people that we know from here are great. The Brewers, the Comptons, the Fredericks, and the Hills. And so we especially love those families and are appreciative of them. And uh, we wanted to mention one of those, especially Lily Compton, has a birthday tomorrow. And she will be 16. No, 6. 6. She'll be 6 tomorrow. So happy birthday, Lily. Yesterday's sermon from Ryan was such a good sermon. I appreciate him allowing us to speak, or allowing me this chance to speak. It was such a good sermon because it was so timely. All of us are stressed out. We're, we're dealing with anxiety. And we need a reminder that we can trust in God and his promises. If God says something, it's going to happen. And that gives us great comfort, even if we don't always understand why God is working the way he is, uh, even if we don't understand if God is the cause of what's going on or if he's just working through it for our good, like Romans 8, 28 says. But yesterday in, in Psalm 11, Ryan gave us a great lesson about how we can trust in God. Now, that's an easy thing to do when things go according to plan, when things go our way and when things happen on our timeline. But how do we trust in God? What does that look like when we don't understand it? Because so often we want things to happen our way and on our timeline, and we'll trust God if that happens. But if it doesn't, we might start to question God. And so I wanted to springboard off what Ryan talked about in his sermon yesterday and share this idea with you and to talk about the slowness of God. And, and Garrett tonight told me uh, that I could speak as long as I wanted to, which I thought was really gracious. But then he said, that's because when everyone's tired of listening, they'll just turn the TV or the computer off anyway. And I laugh, but then I realize, you know what, that's true. Uh, so I'll try not to keep you too long tonight. Uh, but if I do, you can't complain because our lesson is on patience and the slowness of God. But we'll try to quickly cover this topic as best we can. You know, I've done something that I am ashamed to admit. I'm going to tell you, hopefully I'm a better person than this now. But I have ordered a pizza. And the person that I ordered it from literally had to drive from their house all the way across town. They had to clock in at their job. They had to go into the kitchen. They had to make the pizza. They had to wait for it to be finished. They had to box it up, put it in their car, and drive it all the way across town to me at my house. And you know what I did when the pizza got there? I said, oh, great. The pizza's here. Now i got to get up and get it. Now, this guy did everything, and I did the bare minimum, and I still complained because it wasn't like I wanted. It wasn't as quick as I wanted. You know, I've heard someone complain before when they're looking at their phone and the internet, the Wi-Fi is taking a second to load, and they say, man, what's this thing's problem? And I've heard someone say, well, look, it's going to space and back. Could you give it a second? And I think that's fair, but we've gotten to where we want everything, and, and we want it instantly, and we want it immediately. You know, imagine if you had the power to have something instantly, if you had the power to, to speak it into existence, and there it was. Well, God had power like that. You remember he said, let there be light, and there was light. But typically, that's not the way that God works. God works very slowly, very methodically, very intentionally, and very patiently. When you see God at work, typically, it's a part of a slow plan. You know, things have become so good in our world that we can have a lot of things instantly. We can order food and have it brought to us. We can think of any movie or any song that crosses our mind and we can look at it, we can listen to it immediately. And that's a really good thing, but, but sometimes we've gotten conditioned to want everything instantly and immediately. And so instead of using this and seeing this as a blessing, 
it actually can become a curse. Because God's way, God's design, is that things happen slower. So quicker can be better, but it really can also be against the nature of God's design, the natural order that he has created for this world. So we can learn what God has done, and we can also learn by how he's done it. So that's what I want us to do tonight. I want us to think, how did God usually do things when he operated in Scripture? Now, we wouldn't have time to look at every example, but I want us to walk through slowly just a few examples in Genesis and then look at a couple examples in the New Testament to see how God worked slowly. Now, it would be easy for us to jump from point to point in Scripture all over the place to try to to prove anything, and, and you can get in trouble when you do that. But I want us to just look at a few right in order and we'll see typically how God operates. So let's start in Genesis chapter 2, and we'll look for the Old Testament examples just in the book of Genesis. So if you open up your Bible and look at Genesis chapter 2, we'll start there. And we'll look at God's slow work in the Old Testament. The first place we read about this is Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and I'll read that for us. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, God didn't rest like we might think of. I get tired from work, and I need to take a a break. I need to rest. But is that how God rested? Well, no, God is all-powerful, so God doesn't get tired. If he did, he wouldn't be God. But when we say God rested, it just means he he stopped. He ceased working. We might look in the back seat to our kids and say, give it a rest. What do we mean by that? Give it a break. Stop for a minute. That's that's what God did. He, He gave it a break and he stopped his work. And so God finished creating the world in those six days and rested on the seventh. Exodus 20, 11 expounds on that. And it says, for in six days, and the Hebrew terminology means six literal days, The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. So here's what I want us to think about. Why would God, who can breathe something into existence, who can think it and have it happen, who could snap his fingers and have the whole universe created, why would a being that powerful take seven days to do something he could do in a millisecond? Well, because God typically works slowly and patiently. Think of another example. Noah. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, Noah is described as a preacher of righteousness. Now, looking back on this event, Noah and the flood, 1 Peter 3.20 says this, God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Okay, well, well, how so? How did God's patience wait? his slowness, how did it show itself in Noah and in the example of the flood? Well, think about this. God could have made an ark for Noah. Couldn't couldn't God have done that? Couldn't God have thought and it appeared? Couldn't God have called the trees out of the forest, uproot themselves and make a boat? God could have made that happen. Could God have thought of another way to save Noah? Could God have picked them up in his hand off the face of the earth above the waters? Could he have put them in a protective bubble? Could he have allowed it to rain and flood everywhere except where they lived? Could he have called them up into heaven temporarily while the flood took place? Well, well, sure, he could have. Well, why make Noah go through all of this, all this song and dance of creating the ark? Well, God's plan involved Noah slowly building an ark. God's plan involved Noah preaching to the people, and it looked like God's plan involved that happening for anywhere from 50 years to 120 years. And there are reasons we think it might be one of those on the end, but somewhere in that time period. So this took a long time. Now let me ask you this, and you know, how many people were saved by the flood? Well, eight. Noah and his family. And that's all. Now, did God know that only Noah and his family would be saved? Well, of course he did. He's God. So then the question is, why would he spend all this time, maybe waste all this time, knowing that God was going to only see Noah and his family be saved. Well, remember 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, God's patience waited. God waited. God gave people time. He gave people years and years and years. And it would be easy for us to look at the flood and say, wow, 
that's a little harsh to have all these people killed, but God waited years and years and years. Now, I want to show you a picture. This was done by Jeremy Pate, who is with Apologetics Press now, and it's a his interpretation from scripture and from archaeology, how Noah and his family might have looked. And it's, it's just a really beautiful picture. Uh, even if you see the guy in the green shirt, his head was modeled off the oldest surviving skull, human skull, that we have. And so this is just a lot of detail has gone into this picture. But I want you to look, about, look at this picture and think about this. The people that weren't saved, they would have seen Noah and his family cutting wood. They would have seen them transporting supplies back and forth, back and forth. They would have seen them start to build the boat. And if you've ever seen a boat be built, it's really evident what it is pretty quickly as it starts to round out. They would have known that that was a boat. And they would have seen the family working on it, adding to it day by day. So let me ask you this. How did the people respond to that 50 to 120 years of preaching and working on the ark? Well, we don't know for sure. They either didn't believe Noah or their hearts were so wicked they couldn't let any good thing in. They couldn't entertain any truthful thought. Now, some people are lost because they've decided not to be a part of the church. And some people are lost because they don't even care enough to stop and to listen. But even though no one else took the opportunity and God knew they wouldn't, God patiently waited while Noah slowly worked because he wanted them to have the chance to be saved. Think about this Old Testament example. What about Abraham? Now, if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 12. And if you take notes in your Bible, this is a spot that you need to have notes. If you are are like I have been, and the Old Testament can be confusing to you, you have to understand Genesis 12. And if you do, the entire rest of the Old Testament can make sense. Because in Genesis 12, God makes three promises to Abraham, and then he spends the rest of the Old Testament fulfilling these three promises. And so if you know these three promises, anywhere you are in the Old Testament, you can see which one God is working to keep, and it'll help you make sense of the Old Testament. I appreciate Frank Chesser at Panama Street in Montgomery when I was in college sharing this with me, and I want to share it with you. First of all, look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, and if you take notes, write a number 1, by this verse, Genesis 12, 2. This is the first promise. God says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. Now, Abraham has not been able to have kids. He's older. He's probably always wanted kids. And God is saying, I'm going to make that dream a reality, but not just one kid, but an entire line of descendants. And we see that happen, don't we? Number two, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. So put a number two by Genesis 12, 7. The second promise Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Now that kind of just makes sense. If God says, I'm going to give you a big family, you've got to have a place for them to live. Uh, If you're like me, if you have daughters, and you're thinking about them marrying a Christian son-in-law one day, or if you've got sons and you're thinking about them marrying a Christian young lady, uh, you might be thinking to yourself, or you might have already said to them, Hey, look, when you get married, you've got to make a home for yourself, and it's not in my house. Go somewhere else to start your family. And that's something real we have to think about. But, but it makes sense if you're going to start a family, you have a place for that family. And so that was promise number two. Promise number three, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. So write a three by Genesis 12, 3. This is the third promise. And God says to Abraham, In you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Now let's pause and think about that. This verse doesn't explain what that means, but let's think about it. What is the only way that Abraham's descendants could bless everyone, not just living, and not that would live, but that have ever lived. Well, when we think about that, and we look at some more verses we won't have time to look at tonight, we see that this is a promise that God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the remedy for our sin problem is going to come through Abraham's family. What a promise. You have no kids and you've wanted them. I'm going to give you a great family. You, you have no land for that family right now to hold. I'm going to give you the land. And then the Savior, God in the flesh, is going to come through your family. Three great promises to Abraham. But here's what I want us to notice quickly about those three promises. Promise number one, a great nation is going to start with Abraham's first child. Well, look at, look at verse four. 
Abraham is how old? He's 75 years old. Imagine being 75 and having your first kid. Well, well Abraham, that's what, what happens here. He, he hasn't even had it yet, and he's already 75. Now think about these two verses. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, and verse 21. So if you want to flip over, Genesis 17, verse 1, and verse 21. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, in verse 21, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So let's do the math. Genesis 12, Abraham is 75. And Genesis 17, now Abraham is going to be 100 when Isaac is born. So what does that mean? How long did it take for God to keep his first promise to Abraham? We haven't even touched the other two. The first promise, 25 years. Could you imagine if someone told you something, gave you a promise, and it had been a year and they hadn't kept it? What about five years? What about a decade? What about two decades? What about 25 years? Well, that's how long it took God to keep his first promise to Abraham. All right, promise number two, I'll give you the land. Remember, he's going to give him family. He's going to give him land for that family to live in. Look at Genesis 15 and verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. Isn't that what happens when Joseph takes them into Egypt? They'll be sojourners in a land that's not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, you might be thinking, well, why so long? Abraham's going to be dead and gone. His kids can be dead and gone at this point. 400 years, why so long? Why didn't God just give him the land then? We'll keep reading. Look at verses 14 through 16. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they'll come out with great possessions. And as for you, you'll go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. And here's the reason. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, God, why would you make Abraham wait more than 400 years for the land that you promised him? He'll be dead and gone by then. God's answer is, you know the evil people that live there right now? It's not time for them to be punished. I'm a long-suffering God. I'm patient. I want to give them time, lots of time. Even if they never repent, even if they never change, I want to, I'm going to give them the time. Generations, more than enough time to repent. And so God makes his friend wait, even past his death, so that the people around him have just the chance to obey God and accept his grace and his mercy. Do you think Peter had this in mind when he wrote 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9? For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, yeah, I'd say he's long-suffering, at least 400 years in this case. We might ask, and sometimes we do, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Do you see what's going on? Do you see the news? Do you see even sometimes how Christians treat each other? Where is Jesus? Why hasn't God brought him back yet? Well, you know, when Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 3, 9, it had been 30 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. And people were starting to doubt that he would ever return. They said, Christians are crazy. He's not coming back. God's answer would be the same thing to us 2,000 years later as it was to Peter 30 years later. I'm giving other people more time, plenty of time and chances to obey me. Abraham might have thought, God, hurry up. The people living there, some of them surely thought, God, thank you for your patience. So while we say, God, please come back, it's getting rough. Some people around us that are reading their Bible, that are going to become Christians, they're going to say to themselves, they're going to think, they're going to say to us, God, God, thank you. Thank you for not coming back. Thank you for your patience. And promise number three, Jesus, the Savior, the solution for sin, is going to come through your family. Turn to Luke chapter 3 and look at verse 23. So Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. Jesus when he began his ministry, was was about 30 years of age. And this is what verse 23 says, being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, the son of. Now, if you start with Joseph and you work your way backwards to Abraham, which is down in verse 34, you'll count 55 generations. Now, archaeology has determined that to be about 2,000 years or so. 
2,000 years. Now that means that we, today, are as close to Jesus, 2,000 years, as Moses was to Jesus, 2,000 years, when God made this promise in Genesis chapter 12. So promise number one, a great nation will come from you. It took 25 years to get it started. Promise number two, I'll give you a great land to live in. It took 400 years to start. Promise number three, Jesus will come through your family seed. It took 2,000 years to happen. Now time fails us to completely develop the rest of Genesis even, but especially the Old Testament. But what would it look like if we did? Creation in seven days, when it could have happened like this. Noah took 50 to 120 years and the three promises to Abraham that we've mentioned. But what about Joseph? He was in the pit, he was in Potiphar's house, and he was in prison for 12 years. Now, it's easy for us to read the end of Genesis and to fly through that, but do you think 12 years felt like a long time to Joseph? Sure it did. What about the slavery in Egypt? What about the time they spent at Mount Sinai getting ready to go into the promised land after leaving slavery? But then what about the time wandering in the wilderness? Uh, What about Joshua leading them into the promised land? Why didn't God say you can have this city and this city? He did, but he made them fight for it and earn it. Why? Because slowness is in God's nature. What about the cycle of the judges, the good kings, the bad kings, the united kingdom, the divided kingdom? First the north falls away, then the south falls away, then Jerusalem is slowly restored. And then about, what about the 400 years between the Testaments? So let's look at two New Testament examples. The first of those two will be slow work in the person of Jesus. You know, we read about Jesus in the Old Testament before he was born. Now, we won't be able to do a word search and find the name Jesus. Well, well, why is that? Well, he hadn't been born yet, and he wasn't given that name until his birth. But, But if we're careful, if we know what we're looking for, we can see that second person of the Godhead active and doing things. We can do that, right? First uh, John, or I'm sorry, John chapter 1 and verse 1 basically tells us that. Verses 1 through 3 read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made, made. Well, who are we talking about? If we keep reading John chapter 1, we find out this is Jesus. So what was he doing? He was in the beginning with God. He was God and everything that was created was through him. You know, when we sing the the days of creation, we say God made this, God made this, and he did. But who do you usually think of? I usually think of the Father. Well, John chapter 1 says that the creative element in creation was the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. And we see that even all the way back in creation. Genesis 1.26 says, let us make man in our image. Our image? I thought God did it. He did. But God is three persons. And so God can say, make him in our image after our likeness. There's Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, active and working. Uh, but what about when he was born? When he took on flesh and when he dwelt among us? You know, if you read the Old Testament, not the New, but you read the Old Testament... And you thought, how is the creator of this world going to enter it when he becomes a human for the first time? Well, you know, I would imagine the sky would split. Lightning would be bursting from every cloud. A booming voice would come over that the whole world could hear, assuring us that this was God, and everyone would take notice. And he would ride down on clouds, maybe on pillars of fire. So so what happened when the creator of the world came to his creation for a visit? The exact opposite. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 is very important. It says this, talking about Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or to be held on to for advantage. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So this is what that verse means. That is, even though Jesus became a human, He was still God, but he emptied himself in some ways. He temporarily gave up some things. So he temporarily gave up some things that would have identified him with God for us. Well, well, like, like what? What did Christ give up when he came to earth? Well, the Bible says God cannot be tempted. Doesn't James chapter 1 say that? Well, wasn't Jesus tempted? So one way that Jesus emptied himself was to allow himself 
to be tempted. What else? Jesus miraculously created the world, but when he came to that world, he didn't use miracles until he started his ministry. In John chapter 2, verse 11, it's talking about Jesus' first miracle ever on earth and says this, turning water into wine, and it says this, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee. So if Jesus started his ministry around age 30, that means Jesus' earthly, first earthly miracle was around age 30. John 2 tells us this was his first, the water into wine. Why couldn't he do miracles on earth until John in chapter 1 and verse 32 says that the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and it remained on him? Well, because he had emptied himself of that ability. And we could go on. But the reason I mention that is a mistake that I make, and maybe you don't do this, but when I read something about Jesus' life, sometimes I want to explain it away. Well, of course he resisted temptation. He's God. God can't be tempted. Or, well, yeah, of course he could get through that. He could just perform a miracle. Of course he could get past something tough because he automatically knew everything and had all power on earth. But that's a mistake. When Jesus came, though he was God and though he remained God, he emptied himself of some divine characteristics to be associated with us in a temporary way and in some ways permanently to be a human like we are. So think about the first man, Adam. He was born how? Well, created. He he was born full grown. But what about Jesus? When he was born, he was born like we are as a baby. There was a conception process. His mother had to carry him nine months or so just like our mothers did for us. When he was born, he was not a finished product. He still had to grow just like we do. And I wish we had the time. Um, If you want more information on this idea, you can look up a a sermon by Melvin Ote uh, at the Del Rey Church of Christ on on the ways that Jesus grew. But Luke chapter 2 tells us something we can't get around. We can't excuse away that Jesus grew in wisdom. That means he wasn't born knowing everything. But he emptied himself of that and had to learn and grow like we do. And he grew in stature. He got bigger. But he also grew in favor with God and man. Now let me tell you this. How could Jesus grow in his relationship with the Father and with those that he had created? Well, because he emptied himself of something that meant he still had to mature just like we do. So Jesus... He lived around 33 years, had a ministry that was about three years long, and it was a slow and steady work, convincing men and women and changing their hearts. There were no shortcuts. There were no cheat codes. There was no fast forward. It was a slow and steady march towards the cross. And let me share one more. This will be our last one, and then I want to make a few application points of what we can do with this knowledge of how God works slow. This will be our last example before we move on. But let's look at the slow work in Paul. Turn to Acts chapter 9. Now, this that I'm about to share is something that I, I just learned in studying for this, and maybe I, you're probably smarter. You've connected the dots on this before, but if not, I think you'll get a lot out of this like I have. But look in Acts chapter 9. What do you think of when you think of Paul? You know, I think of a, a great missionary, a great speaker, someone who was brave, someone that had a good attitude, even though bad stuff was happening. I, I think about someone who wrote uh, 13 books, of the New Testament, but that's not how his life started, and that's not even how his Christian life started. In the early church, you remember Saul was going around killing Christians, trying to put an end to what he saw really as a sect, a false new religion that blasphemed God. And in Acts chapter 9, he's on his way to a city called Damascus to arrest some Christians. And while he's on the way, Jesus stops him, and blinds him and has a conversation with him. And Jesus tells Saul to go into Damascus and wait on somebody that will come and tell you what to do. So Jesus sends a man named Ananias to Saul to teach him. And it works. Saul believes it. I wonder if he remembers back to that sermon he heard Stephen preach in Acts chapter 7. And then Ananias is saying the same things and he's fearful of what he's seen. But, but whatever, it works. And he becomes a Christian. It worked. And you know what he does? He immediately starts preaching the truth and telling people about Jesus. But look at verses 22 and 23. But Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. 
when many days had passed, here's the key, the Jews plotted to kill him. So he was going to Damascus to kill those preaching Jesus. And when he gets there, he's preaching Jesus. And the people that were going to help him and support him, now they're trying to kill him. Look at verses 28 through 29. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem. So, so he's preaching in Damascus and they're going to kill him. So he leaves and he goes to Jerusalem, the, the pinnacle of, of the Jewish religion, their capital. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. So Saul becomes a Christian. He preaches in Damascus and they try to kill him. So he goes to a bigger city, Jerusalem, where more Jews are, the center of the Jewish religion, and they try to kill him. He appears to be headed for the same fate, uh, fate that Jesus had, that Stephen had in Acts chapter 7. They're going to kill Saul. Well, look at verse 30. When the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea, and they sent him to Tarsus. Does that name ring a bell? Where was Saul born? Tarsus. So they try to kill Saul everywhere he preaches. So what does God do? God send, sends him to his smaller hometown. Now we don't read about Saul again until Acts chapter 11, verse 25, only two chapters later, when Barnabas goes to get him. But it's estimated that Saul stayed in Tarsus for seven to ten years. Now it, it's, it's easy to read these stories and to gloss over time, to miss what's actually going on. Saul is converted, but he doesn't instantly become the Paul that we know. God spends the next decade of his life getting him ready for what's to come. We can read Acts 9 to Acts 11, 25 in 10 minutes or less, and it goes by fast, but do you think those 10 years felt fast to Saul? No wonder Paul could later say, I have learned to be content. Yeah, I imagine he did learn in that decade. Paul went on three famous missionary journeys where he taught people. He helped establish churches in new areas. And on those trips, he traveled more than 12,000 miles. Why didn't God just pick him up and move him from place to place? He could have. Well, the reason is this, and I think it really encapsulates everything we've, we've looked at so far. It's about more than the destination. It's about the journey that gets us there. I want to read a, a few verses, and as I do, I want you to think about this Saul we just talked about, the one that became a Christian. But other Christians were afraid of him and wouldn't work with him. The Saul that preached anyway, and then for his reward, they tried to kill him. So he moves to another city and has the same thing happen. And, and then, as he's on fire for the Lord, he's sent home for a decade to wait. And when he's done with all that waiting, what does he have to do? He has to go through this. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 28. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jew the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That is a violent graphic process. Three times I was beaten with rods. Three time, or One time I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and the day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from many other things, there's the daily pressure of my anxiety for all the churches. You know, sometimes we are tempted to think, I love God, I'm living for God, I'm doing what's right, I help out at church, and look at my life, where is God? God reassures us, those that he loves, those that he uses the most and values the most, God works slowly in their lives. God works slowly in Paul, he works slowly in Jesus. He works slowly in the book of Genesis and the whole of the Old Testament. So here's what I want us to finish with. A few points quickly we'll try to go through. What can we learn today from the slowness of God? I mean, it, it's evident from these examples and more than we can look at, God doesn't do things like this very often. He didn't do that in anyone's life we've studied. He did that very rarely, and he's not going to do that in our life. So what can we learn from the slow process that God has taken and takes in us? Here are four things quickly that I want us to look at. The first thing is we need God's patience. We need it. God can speak and light appears. God can breathe life into dirt and make a person. With God, anything is possible, so so why move so slowly? Why take so long? And, and the answer is this, for us, 
It's not God that has to wait and move slowly, but he does it for us because we need him to. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18, it says this, Therefore the Lord waits, oh great, we're going to get an explanation. Why? To be gracious to you. God is patient for us and we need it. You know, if you were converted later in life, that is, you weren't raised in a Christian home, but by providence or by chance, you came across, across a Christian or you studied yourself into being a Christian. If you were converted later in life, you needed God's patience to get to that moment. If you are wandering outside of the church now, and there might be somebody that is checking the boxes, is showing up, is going through some of the motions, but they're not really living it, or they're caught in a sin that no one else knows about or very few people. If you're wandering from the church right now, you need God's patience until you make the right decision and until you come back. And in everyday life for the Christian, we need God's patience as we try to do our best, but we often fail. Number two, after the fact that we need God's patience for ourselves, is this idea. We need to be patient with ourselves. And we need God's patience for us, but we need to be patient with ourselves. If you're like me, then your life is a mess. Uh, Maybe just a small mess, or maybe a huge mess. Maybe just sometimes and maybe all the time. You don't want anyone else to know it because it feels like you're fine and everybody else is fine and so you put a mask on and you don't post about the hard stuff on social media. You say things are good and I'm fine and you move on, but but I know what a mess I am better than you can. I know my flaws. I know my mistakes. And because of that, we might beat ourselves up. We might live with shame. We might even want to quit and maybe think, look, why bother? Everyone else is doing great. I'll never make it. And we might give up. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 is famous for being the love chapter. Have you noticed the first thing that love is? Look at verse 4. Love is patient. Now, why do you think that that's the first thing that God in his infinite wisdom listed that love is? Well, maybe because we have a tendency to move too fast to expect too much, to be disappointed too easily. But not love. No, love is patient. That's not just patience for other people, but but that's patience for yourself. That's patience with myself. God does not expect us to be perfect. And because we're not perfect, he does not expect us to carry shame and guilt for the mistakes that we've made. Instead, he's going to be patient with us, And as we learn to love ourselves, he he expects us to start being patient.